So in every part of life, there are people who are incredibly talented. Whether in sports or entertainment, these people exude greatness. Now we put a lot of value in them and their abilities, but we have it all wrong. There is only one who is great, and he brings hope to the hopeless, sight to the blind, grace instead of shame. His name is Jesus, and he is the GOAT, greatest of all time. Yeah. Well, good morning, church. Happy New Year. My name is Matt Brooks. I'm the senior pastor here at First Baptist Church of Broken Arrow. There is a phrase, uh, there is a movement that has developed within our culture in order to describe something that you've never seen before, in order to describe the best of the best, something that will capture a moment that you can't describe. People have just now been simply calling that moment the GOAT. Or this player is the greatest of all time. He is the greatest there ever has been, the greatest there ever was, the greatest I have ever seen. He is the GOAT. And so we're going to have a series on Colossians 1 and 2, signifying once and for all who the Bible says is the highest of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this has been trending on Twitter. There are emojis. There are even now merchandise that is going out. I had Jason Parks come and find me. Jason and Donna Parks have been members of our church for a long, long time. Jason sings on our praise team. Jason and Donna are involved in our student ministry. But he said, hey, pastor. He said, in light of this new series, he said, my wife got several of these and listen to this. So I, I, I still love this. So I'm going to make sure that, that we get plenty of these for you. So every point that I make, you can either say amen or you can push this button right here because Jesus Christ is the greatest of all time. Philip, do you mind holding on to this for me? Praise God. Philip Smith, ladies and gentlemen, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you want to open your Bibles and meet the book of Colossians, we are starting a new series this 2024 on who is the supreme above the highest of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to remind you that our content team has put together a devotional that walks right alongside the sermon. I'm so grateful for our content team, communication team. If you text the word sermon to 45776 church, you can now in 2024 get a devotional in both English and Spanish. Praise the Lord as we continue to follow Christ. Christ and make disciples to make disciples to reach BA and beyond. Paul in Colossians 1 and 2 is going to give us one of the strongest statements on the deity of Christ in the entire Bible. Now, I'll remind you that each one of Paul's epistles have a dominant theme. So the book of Romans, that is justification by faith. And the book of Ephesians, that is the mystery of Christ in his church. And Philippians, it's this unbridled joy that God can only give us in and through faith in Christ. But in Colossians, it is the absolute supremacy and sufficiency of Christ as the head of creation and his church. Colossians, more than any other letter in the entire New Testament, exalts Christ above all things. And church, I want to remind us as we start this year together that we've all made New Year's resolutions to get better physically. But what decisions and habits can help us be healthier spiritually? And what I want to do today is as we study Colossians 1, 1 through 8, there is going to be this phrase that Paul is going to use in verses four and five that is key for us optimally growing in Christ in 2024. It sees faith, hope, and love. That it is a dedication to grow in faith. That is an intentionality of showing and exposing hope. It is also sharing and showing his love. Paul says these are the spiritual marks of a godly church that these are things that God blesses exponentially for those who follow Christ. Faith, hope, and love have been a familiar triad in Paul's writings, and growing in these things is a wonderful year that we're gonna start our year together. Faith, hope, and love. With that in mind, why don't you look at the first two verses, and let's introduce this incredible book of the Apostle Paul, the book of Colossians. Paul says, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father. Now, at the time of this writing, Paul is imprisoned in Rome. He is under house arrest. And as the primary author of Colossians, he introduces to these individuals that he's never seen, that he's never met before, his identity, status, and role in Christ. Paul says, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Now, I'll remind you that Paul was arguably the most influential individual for Christ of all time. 
He was of Jewish ancestry. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Additionally, he was also a Roman citizen, which meant then that Paul was a one-man SWAT team for the gospel of Christ. The New Testament describes Paul as being a missionary, an evangelist, a church planner, a disciple maker, a theologian. Oh yeah, and in his spare time, he wrote 13 books in the New Testament. Paul introduces himself here simply as an apostle, an apostolos, one who is sent specifically for God with a purpose. Paul is telling these people that I'm not doing this on my own. This isn't from my own authority, but rather from the authority of Christ Jesus myself. Apostle has a multitude of meanings in the New Testament. It can just mean simply one who is a messenger or an emissary of someone. On December the 30th, this past year, I was hanging out in Red Rock, Oklahoma. Anyone ever been to Red Rock, 30 minutes north of Stillwater? Was some of the best of God's country here in Oklahoma. And we were hanging out at the farm there. And on December the 30th, it's a special day on the farm because it is my mother-in-law and father-in-law's wedding anniversary. And they celebrated 45 years of marriage on December the 30th. And so my father-in-law is doing what farmers always do. He was working. And so I was on my way to town anyway, and I stopped by to see him right there in the office. And he said, hey, he said, are you going to town? He said, yeah. He said, hey, I need you to do a favor for me. He said, I need you to buy me four dozen roses. Four dozen roses. He said, yeah. He said, I want you to give them to me. He said, then I'll make sure I give them to Connie, my mother-in-law. I said, well, that sounds wonderful. So I headed to the super Walmart there in Ponca City, America, and I bought four dozen roses. And so I'm coming out to Walmart and walking out in this parking lot with this handful of roses. And then there was this older gentleman who was passing me and his wife. And he looked at me and these flowers and he looked back at his wife and he looked at me again. And he said, someone's in real, real big trouble. <laughs> And so then I had the pleasure of telling him, no, sir. I said, these aren't for me. These are for my father-in-law. And they are celebrating 45 years of marriage today. And I said, I've got 48 roses from him to his wife. And he's going to give three of these roses to his granddaughters. And that guy said, that's a wise man right there. (laughs) Paul says, I'm an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a messenger. I am sent with divine authority. Specifically, this word apostle here speaks of the 12 and Paul who in the book of Acts knew and witnessed the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Christ. He was also as Christ's representative was the means in which God would use to build his church and grow his kingdom. And Paul says, I'm not self-appointed, but this was God's appointment for me. And you and I can learn much by this little phrase. You see, as we head together in 2024 and as we follow Christ, the same God that sent Paul sends you. The same God that had a purpose for Paul has a purpose for all of us here this morning in 2024. But we must remind ourselves in the humility of Paul, we are not appointed by ourselves. We don't create our own agendas. We don't achieve our own purposes. No, we don't get to use God for our purposes. He uses us for his And may God grow us mightily through faith, hope, and love. And may we reach be and beyond by multiplying disciples to follow Jesus like never before. Now, I'll also remind you that Paul never did this alone. You'll notice back in verse one, he introduces here in Timothy, our brother, and then also in verse two, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Now, who is Timothy? Timothy was a native of Lystra. He became a Christian during Paul and Barnabas' missionary journey, specifically to the region of Lystra. Timothy was beloved by Paul. In fact, historically, he was Paul's most trusted associate. And they were literally sharing Christ together and building God's kingdom together for almost 15 years. It is without question that though Paul was influential in reaching Christ in Timothy's life, that Paul needed Timothy just as much as Timothy needed Paul. You see, we're the same way. Every Paul needs a Timothy, and every Timothy needs a Paul. Within the orchestration of God's kingdom, he naturally drives us together. There is a sense in which you and I are made for each other. We need one another as we continue to move forward for Christ in 2024. I think that's why we're so passionate here about PATH. 
That, that it's not just enough for you and I to engage and worship, but, but no, we, we want to invest in a few. We want to connect in a group. We want to make an impact. We want to give our lives away. Why? Because this is the biblical example of discipleship. That this is what people who loved and cherished Jesus above all things in the New Testament did as a way of life. As a way of obedience, this is how they best glorified Christ in their life. We need one another. If you're here today and you're not part of, of a group in our church, or whether it be on Sunday mornings or Sunday nights or, or Wednesdays, or for those that are now branching off into neighborhoods all around Tulsa, go to our Next Step Center right after this service. Meet with Tommy Klein, our spiritual development pastor. You heard him doing our announcements this morning. If you're here and you're not investing in a few, men meeting with men, women meeting with men, women, hanging out around the Bible, praying for one another, encouraging one another. My 365, we, we meet on Friday mornings. It's one of the best parts of my week. We need people that are a little further ahead of us in this walk with Christ and that are a couple of steps behind in this journey for Christ. And we can encourage one another with the gospel. We can pray for one another. We can memorize the scriptures. We can grow in Christ and faith. And that's exactly what Paul did. Not only with Timothy, our dear brother, but look at verse two, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Now you see this word saints here? Circle it in your Bible. It should encourage you mightily. Do you notice this word saints is in the plural? Why? Because we have a dual reality the moment you give your life to Christ. No matter where you are physically, you are unchangeable in Christ spiritually. You and I are citizens of heaven that live right now in Tulsa. Do you see this? That though you and I are temporarily here, this is not our home. That we are on assignment. That we are saints of a king to live out this gospel in and those around us. Saints speaks in the New Testament of those who faithfully set apart their lives toward God. And please notice that Paul references here not just a handful of Christ followers in Colossae, but every single one of them are saints. You are who God says you are. You are not what your feelings are. You are not what your emotions are. You are not what your past is. You are who you are in Christ. And the moment that you give your life to Christ, God says you are one of his beloved. And as one of his beloved, you are a saint. There are two classifications of people then in this world, the saints and the ain'ts. And if you are in Christ, beloved, you are a saint. Paul would frequently use this word throughout his 13 letters in the New Testament to describe an inward commitment, a disposition of one's faith toward holiness in Jesus Christ. Is that what you're prioritizing this year? I know so many of us, we have physical goals and we have goals with our businesses and goals with our children and goals, some of, some of you in athletics and those sorts of things. Is holiness a priority for your life in 2024? Can I remind you with even in this phrase that your life will never change until something changes. So what is it in your life and your habits and your decisions that God is going to use specifically in order to enact, create, maximize that change? Is there a desire this morning to grow in your faith? So what decisions do you have to make to make that happen in 2024? What disciplines, habits do you have to embrace? Is there a desire this morning to extend his hope, to live in the reality of this hope? We're going to talk about it here in a minute. Verses four and five. What has to change in your life to maximize that in 2024? Is there a desire to share and show his love? I don't know about you, but the more I pray for God to let me show and display his love, the more people he places in my life who need it. Praise God. May we be intentional in 2024. May we have our eyes on the prize and may we live in light who God declares we are in Christ, his saints. Paul then begins this letter to Colossae. Now the amazing thing is that before Christ, about 500 years before our king would come, Colossae was a thriving cosmopolitan city on the Lycus River. 
It was really known for two things in antiquity. One, earthquakes that would occasionally, every five to eight years it appeared, would completely ravish every town on the Lycus River within this valley. It was also known for chalk. Literally, it was a modern marvel within the ancient world that these chalk formations would develop indescribable magnitude and beauty. But at the time of Paul's writing, it was a declining city among towering mountains in southwest modern Turkey. It was literally by the time of Colossae, the smallest city that Paul would ever write to in the New Testament. In fact, if Paul had not heard of this word from Epaphras, we would have never even known what God was doing in Colossae. We would have never even heard of the city of Colossae unless Paul wrote a letter there, the letter of Colossians. But may I remind you that there is no such thing as insignificant to our God, that our God makes a habit of taking what is small and the least to shame the proud and to give glory only to him, that you and I in this small step of faith and obedience in 2024 can have a magnitude and impact that only he gets the glory for. Paul, within this sense then, introduces the entire content of this letter with this phrase right here in verse two, grace to you and peace. Paul uses this phrase in all 13 of his letters. Now this request here is is not specifically speaking of saving grace as the Christ followers in Colossae were already saved. Paul here is intentionally blending two things, a Greek greeting and a Hebrew greeting. It was the customary greeting in the Greek world at Paul's time to say Karen to one another. Greetings, the fullest to you in the pursuit of your gods. Paul here is using this intentionally as a means to communicate the gospel. For grace here in verse two speaks of God's unconditional goodwill toward all through Christ. He also here uses peace, which was a Hebrew expression. It's of the word shalom. It speaks of a state of well-being. You know what Paul is communicating here? that in order for us to be everything that Christ has called us to be, in order for us to be faithful, in order for us to be fruitful, in order for us to be obedient, we need his grace in all aspects of our lives. Secondly, for those who truly have his grace, they will also experience his peace for no one is beyond his grace. That no individual is beyond his redemption or rescue. So God sends us to them so that we will live out in a loving way and share this gospel that is still changing lives. We must have his grace before we experience his peace. And may you be overwhelmed by the grace of God this year. May in every aspect of your life, may you feel this never ending, always abounding sense of God's love and presence in your life. May you not run from that, but run to that as his peace reigns in and through your life. It is within this setting that Paul now gives one prayer in one of the longest sentences in the entire New Testament. Verses three and eight in the original languages are one prayer and one sentence. Let's read it together. Paul says, we always thank God, the father of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all of the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you've heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed the whole world as it's bearing fruit and increasing as it always does among you. Since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Let's stop right there. Now remember, Paul did not know the Colossian church personally. He'd never been to this region. He'd never been to this area as far as we know. But please know that Paul says on every occasion that I pray for the Colossians, I ascribe thanks to God for you. For what specifically? Paul says three things in verses four through five. For your faith, for your love, and for your hope. Look back at verse four since I've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. It was a great Bible teacher of yesteryear, W.E. Vine, who says, when a man obeys God, he gives the only possible evidence that in his heart, he believes God. You and I currently live in a post-truth culture. 
Everything is relative, everything is subjective, everything is day by day, moment by moment, feeling by feeling. What is faith? That is not faith in the Bible. Paul says, when I heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, he uses here the word pistuo. It means to believe, to be persuaded to something, are you ready for this? That is true in something that you trust. Faith then in the Bible is based upon evidence. Faithful is not a wishful longing to God, but rather fact based upon a cognitive choice. What does faith mean? Uh, I was struck this week by studying this text and uh, I found an excerpt from a Scottish missionary by the name of John Patton, who loved Jesus and loved people. And God called John and his wife to the South Pacific to minister to the natives there. And John was translating the word faith in the New Testament. And you know what he described and translated faith as? Listen to this. When you lean your whole self on Christ. I love that. What does faith mean? It means leaning your whole self, choosing to solely depend upon Christ. See, that's why faith for Paul consisted of three aspects. Number one, it was a personal trust in Christ, a turning to Christ, a dependence upon Christ, a sole desire to follow Christ. So not only was it a personal trust in Christ, it was also a commitment in Christ. Faith to Paul was always a commitment, an abide in him, my identity, the, my soul worth and value is based upon him which then thirdly meant a a daily living out of one's faith for him. It was expressed in a lifestyle. True faith always involves a changed life. And faith, the Bible says, connects us to God, to eternal life through Jesus Christ. But faith also gets its value from its object and its power in its action. And faith was lived out among the beloved in Colossae. Look back at verse four. By faith in Christ and the love that you have for all saints. Did you see how both faith and love are connected here? This word love here is one of our favorite in the New Testament. Agape. Describes a sacrificial love, a selfless, unconditional love. It was the sacrificial and unconditional love of God and loving all in this region that was an ongoing reality for the believers in Colossae. They took very seriously the admonition of the Apostle John in 1 John 4, 20. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. He is not living truth, John says. Love then is the overflow of faith that is expressed in a lifestyle. A lifestyle that is selfless, Christ-like in our actions toward others. You and I are commanded to love God first, to love others, to love ourselves last and least. It is this example that God used through his people to change the world. In Colossae. Now, how in the world could they do this? How in the world were they exemplifying this faith and love? Look at verse 5. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, Paul says. The Colossians' faith in Christ, their love for God and Christ and one another, was empowered and was sustained by their hope. A hope that regardless of what happened to them, regardless of their calamity, regardless of their struggles, they had a secured inheritance, an eternal life awaiting for them in heaven. It was their confident assurance with Christ that prevailed over all other things in their life until they were with Christ. May we have this same encouragement. May we be people of hope, extending his hope to others a confident assurance of what is to come. That there is nothing in our life that this life can take from us. That know everything we have, we're stewards, we're managers of, we're owners of nothing, stewards of everything. But yet what awaits us is a confident assurance of what is to come. 
Not just perfection in heaven, but the person of heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. We will have him in his fullest and in his glory. So may we not walk around each and every day like one of my favorite comics of old, Charlie Brown, who saw almost every instance in his life as half empty, not half full. Who, who would declare himself a, a perpetual pessimist, who, who would say such things as, I think I'm afraid to be happy because whenever I get happy, something bad always happens. May we not be this way, Charlie Browns. No, may we be full of hope. May we be people who have a confident assurance of what is laid up for us in heaven. May we take the words of Charlie Brown where he says, really thin, I found in my life all you need is love, but a little bit of chocolate every now and then doesn't hurt either. I think I would add one more thing to that, Charlie Brown. Hope. Real hope. Hope in the Bible is always vertical before it is ever horizontal. Hope is always something that God not only assures, but that God gives in any circumstance. You see, you and I, can be hopeless in some things, helpless in other things, because we naturally think there's, there's no other alternative, there's no other way out. But for those of us in Christ, we all know that everything in our life happens for our good and for God's glory. That there's nothing that, that God has allowed to happen to us or through us that has not yet been approved by God himself for us. It is this then assurance that you and I step out in faith, an assurance of a reality that Peter would say in 1 Peter 1, 4, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading in heaven, kept for you, he says. You see, hope doesn't produce faith or love, but it does empower it. It does sustain our faith and love. How can we be so sure? Look back at verse 5. Paul says that this is all made possible because of the things that you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. Literally, the message of truth, which is the gospel. You see this word here? It's one of the most important words that you'll learn and love in 2024. It's of the word euangelion. It is mentioned 54 times in the New Testament. It generally means throughout the Bible, one who brings or pronounces good news. The interesting thing is, is that this word does not have its etymology in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament. It was used by Old Testament writers to describe reports from the battlefield, usually positive ones, of the victory that was assured to come. It was used in the major and minor prophets to begin to announce the establishment of God's saving act through his Messiah, that the Mashiach would come and would deliver his people from their sins. The New Testament writers then would rightly apply this word, euangelion, as truth to Jesus, who is unquestionably the fulfillment of all truth. And Paul says here, the source of all of our hope. What is the gospel then? J.D. Greer says it well when he says the gospel is that Christ has suffered the full wrath of God for my sin. That Jesus Christ traded places with me, living the perfect life I should have lived and dying the death that I have been condemned to die. What is the gospel? The gospel is, is that God treated Jesus at the cross as if he lived our life. And then by faith in Christ, he treats us like Jesus in our lives. Do you see this beautiful gospel? Do you see how the gospel then does not just save us, but grows us and empowers us to become more like Christ? That God daily encourages us with his good news. You want to know why? Because we are saved, Paul says, from something. We are no longer damned in our sins. We are no longer judged in our iniquities. We are declared righteous by God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are then saved, pardoned, adopted, transformed, and glorified to become more like Christ. Because you and I are saved from something into something. Look at verse six. 
which has then come to you as indeed in the whole world as it is bearing fruit and increasing in each one among you since the day you have heard it. Pointedly, that you are constantly bearing fruit through the gospel. Did, did you see this point that Paul is making here, church? That it is the inward growth from the gospel that leads to the outward evidence of the gospel. The gospel is fruit bearing. The gospel is Christ in him crucified. The gospel then is never inactive. It cannot be stopped. If you have truly given your life to the root of Christ, then the fruit of Christ will be evident in your life. No fruit, no root, Paul says. Uh, I don't know about you, but Fruit's not always the, the easiest thing for me to enjoy. I think I will say that the reputation of my affinity for fruit, even among you, is a little bit exaggerated. I love fruit, as long as it's fried and in a pie. <laughs> I love fruit when it's covered with whipped cream or ice cream. Uh, I love fruit and gummy flavors. I was watching a fifth grade basketball game yesterday and my soon-to-be four-year-old needed a snack. And so she went to the concession stand and got these fruit gummy bear things. And I began to try one and try another one. And she kind of began to look at me and say, hey, these are mine, not yours. And I began to remind her, hey, we need to share and show the love of Christ here, all right? Pass another gummy bear. Maybe it's how I started in my love for fruit. I remember Brent and I, one time we were hanging out in Dallas, Texas, and uh, we were house sitting right around this time of year. And, and I'd set very pointed goals for weight loss for the month of January. So I was starting each day with fruit. And sure enough, I woke up that morning in this house that we were house sitting in, and there was the most beautiful apple that I'd ever seen in my life. Just green and luscious and vibrant. And so I grabbed this apple and took off. And so living in Dallas, for those of you who have been there, you get stuck in traffic, you know, walking across the street. And, and so I was unable to eat this apple. I was just navigating traffic. And then the moment I got to church, I was, I was thrust right into a meeting and, you know, we began to meet with all of these people. The entire time this apple was on the table. Everyone was looking at it. Everyone was admired. Everyone was, hey, good job, Maddie. Yep, starting the year off right. And so then I go to my office and I take this bite of this luscious, vibrant apple and to my horror, it was fake. <laughs> Styrofoam. So I'd spit it up all over my desk and, you know, was kind of making sure my, my window was set just right so no one saw this. And then I began thinking, Lord, I've been walking around for two hours now in this church with an apple that was fake. Everyone thought it was real, but it wasn't. Paul says, when I hear of what Christ is doing through you, oh, church at Colossae, it is not fake. It's real. That the evidence of the root of Christ is producing his fruit in your life and in your church. That there were people that were accepting Christ. That there were gospel acts everywhere. That God's message is meant to be displayed in and through his people. May we be a church that desires to be the real, authentic expression of the Lord Jesus Christ to those around us. If we be real people who others see we need his grace, we need his love, we need his mercy and his spirit in every aspect of our lives in 2024. And that is why in verses seven through eight, Paul moves from the message of the gospel to now the messengers. Look at it very quickly. And he says, just as you've heard from it, Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. God calls all of us to be faithful and fruitful. It was the great preacher of old, John Knox, who said it well when he says, God delights in giving his glorious spirit to ordinary people. Who is even the primary one responsible for this letter? It was a faithful servant, Paul says, a man by the name of Epaphras, literally a nobody in Christ. Epaphras more than likely accepted Christ during Paul's ministry to the region of Ephesus. It would have been then the faithful preaching and love of Christ 
by Epaphras to these people at Colossae that led to this church starting there. Epaphras would have had to travel a thousand miles from Colossae to Rome to meet with Paul and to discuss with him all that Christ was doing in and through this church. He's this fellow servant. He's this one that chooses to give a life long fellowship to the Lord Jesus Christ. This word servant here is only mentioned here in Colossians 4, 7. It describes an individual who hands their life over completely to their master. Have you done that yet? In this first week of January? Have you told the Lord, whatever it is this year, whoever it is, whatever it is you're asking of me, I'm handing myself over completely to you for your glory. You see, God loves to use the least and the last and the lost to faithfully move his kingdom. And Paul says, I've heard of this from your fellow servant Epaphras. I've heard of your love in the spirit. Remarkably, as we close, the only reference of the Holy Spirit in the entire book of Colossians is right here. Can I tell you that the Lord is intentional in that? that Paul is reminding us, are you ready for this? That the love that mimics the love of God can only be created and sustained by the Spirit of God. May it be this soul dependence and soul focus that God would use in us to grow our faith, to extend his hope, and to share and show his love in 2024. Now, there was a man by the name of John Wesley. He was the founder of the Methodist movement in the Church of England, who has, has now just tragically abdicated the word of God and the glory of God, the, the biblical position on biblical manhood, biblical womanhood, biblical marriage. Just shameful, abhorrent. But their start was from a, a fervent prayer warrior, an evangelist by the name of John Wesley, who was a man of prayer and dedication and faith and he had a phrase that in every sermon, that every revival that he would share at the end of it that I want to use to start our year together in 2024. He says, do all the good you can by all the means you can in all the places you can at all the times you can to every person that you can for as long as you can. Amen. May the love of the Spirit be so vibrant and powerful that it's endlessly used in and through us this year. May it empower us to be steadfast, to go the extra mile with people that God places around us. And may it inspire us to keep ourselves growing in the faith, continuing to extend his hope and continuing to share and show his love. To Paul, these spiritual marks are what is evident in a godly, growing, vibrant church. And as we study this book of Jesus Christ, the supreme, the above, the highest of all, may God accelerate these things in our lives as we continue to love and champion him above all things with faith, hope, and love.